Hey everyone, it's Jim. And Charles. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to screw it up. And Tube Lab number 183. And today, we're actually going to talk about a couple of really fun things. Uh, first off, we're going to be talking about a mm, kind of a rediscovery that one of our really good customers did. Uh, so Charles is going to talk about these uh, wonderful 6SN7 tubes. And we have a surprise for you. The headphone kit amp moved ahead really quickly. In fact, you got back late Monday. Yeah, yeah. And a nice vacation and feeling energized. And man, I just threw myself at it. <laughs> yeah, and three days later, you almost had the production prototype um, built. Anyways, we're going to go, we'll look to see uh, how far along it is, but I think we'll probably be listening to it this weekend. I hope so. Okay, first caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, what have you got to show us, Charles? Uh, and... Yeah, and I think we should give a shout out. We often get ideas for Tube Lab from uh, the you, you the listeners, uh, as well as customers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes both, and we have a good customer who's who's been with us for years now, and she is um, she's a very dedicated audiophile, and she's very precise in um, how she goes about testing things and one of the things that um, she's always looking for is the best tube of a type for one of her systems yeah and she's made a discovery or i should say a rediscovery because in the in the guitar world everybody knows about the rca 6s and 7s yeah we've got one right here these are the classic rca black plate let me see if i can get that better and focus it's hard to make up the plates actually on camera yeah dark but, dark colors don't they don't come out well unless they've got some contrast yeah and these are also commonly called uh silver label rcas you can identify them by the silver paint although that really doesn't mean much of anything whenever you're you're talking about this type of tube except that a silver label is um, an earlier production version mm -hmm. and uh, this is also the tall base, so is, that identifies it as an earlier production as well. And these are known, uh, as Dad was saying, uh, by guitarists as being really good tubes. Yeah, particularly for their tone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And everybody um, who amplifies um, an instrument um, who's serious about their sound um, does exactly what we do in audio. They roll tubes, and, and they get the might right have. Tone out of it. Yeah. yeah, they might have in their kit bag, they might have a dozen tubes, depending on how, how they feel and <laughs> how the equipment's sounding, and they'll just start plugging things in. <laughs> and in fact, they're known to actually change resistors on the fly <laughs> in the hopes of changing the sound. Yeah, that's dedication. Here we have a later version of the same tube, exact same plate structure on here. Another one that's made by RCA in the U.S., but these aren't the tubes that our customer was raving about. No, she was raving about something a little bit different. And that's these guys right here. And on the face of it, they look the same. I mean, if we compare these two side by side, you'd be hard pressed telling the difference. I mean, this one's just a little bit of a shorter bottle. Show the micas. Yeah, let's see if I can get that on screen here. The micas are identical. Oh, uh, come on, focus. There we go. Yeah, micas are identical, the plates are identical, the getters are identical, they are essentially the same tube on the inside, but these were not made in the US. These were actually Canadian produced tubes. Just well, hang on a second. Hmm? They weren't entirely made in, in the US. Or Well, we, we're not actually sure entirely. Uh, it, what we think is going on is similar to what happened with Rogers and, oh, we're out of focus again, <laughs> with Rogers and Sylvania. Um, Rogers was importing the internal structure of tubes from Sylvania into Canada and then producing the tubes here. And it seems like this is the same thing that happened with a, um, oh, what was the name of the company again? I think we just had the listing up here. Yeah, I've got it. I'll get it for you. 
Uh, RVC. So RVC was a Canadian uh, manufacturer that made tubes just for rebranding, just for all the different manufacturers and uh, and equipment providers inside of Canada. Equipment uh, manufacturers like Stark bought tubes from them. Yeah, Stark's famous, of course, for tube testers. And Westinghouse, Rogers even bought them from them. And of course, Canadian Marconi. That's hard to see right there. And it's even possible that Marconi actually owned the original patent. Um, because RCA itself uh, was formed by GE and um, uh, later on a couple of other companies joined them. Um, and what, what RCA started out as is Marconi USA. And GE purchased them and reformed the company into what eventually became known as RCA. Mm -hmm. And so there were a lot of patents being licensed, being shared. Sometimes it was a split company or something like that. And we're not, as I said earlier, we're not entirely sure what happened. But what we do know has happened here is that we've ended up with essentially an RCA tube that was made in Canada. And from our listening tests, they sound the exact same as the U.S. made ones, which is just absolutely lovely. It's fantastic to find these things. And these are the tubes that our customer was raving about. And what was Rachel talking about? A nice amount of mid-range warmth, mm -hmm. good detail, and essentially what that means is that the tube is in balance because the more warmth you have, the more second harmonic distortion you've got. And generally the less detail you have. Because you basically mask the detail um, underneath the distortion level. Yeah. So you, you don't want so much warmth that you can't hear any detail, at least if you're an audiophile, but you <laughs> don't want all detail and a very neutral sound, or you may as well have a solid state amp. Yeah, but some people prefer it that way, but I think most like to find a nice balance, a nice balance that works in their system, works for their ears, and according to her, this is a nice balance tube for warmth and well, I think she was a little bit more, <laughs> more enthusiastic than maybe, that. Maybe. But the thing to remember is this, is this tube works extremely well in her system, with her music, in her room, and that's always something to, to bear in mind. You're going to see if you're keen about checking online to see what the latest tube is and what people have to say, that can be a lot of fun, but you have to be really careful because often you'll see somebody making a raving post about some modern tube um, that if they compared it to an earlier vintage type, a good quality vintage type, they would realize, oh, I'm <laughs> raving about something that really is not very good. So you know, everything is relative and what you've experienced is what matters to you. So in our case, in the case of Rachel and in the case of many of our customers, they've got a lot of tubes to roll. So they have a good sort of a lot, a memory or a library of the sonic properties of their tubes. And that really helps you fairly quickly. I mean, we plug in a, a new tube type and within seconds we're either no that's got to come out <laughs> yeah we sort <laughs> or, of get a profile for how how good it's sounding yeah. yeah and again that's in our system as well um i mean the other day um we i plugged in i found actually a really nice i sorry i didn't pull them a really nice uh pair of go grab them they're in the yeah yeah uh, i found a really nice close match pair of rca clear top 6c g7s and um, there's some Japanese types that people have been really getting into. And I thought, this is a nice looking close match pair. I'm going to drop it into the Universal Pre and just see how they sound. Well, <laughs> I put on one of my favorite uh, uh, live jazz recordings and I spent the evening listening to them. And yeah, so here's... Here's the RCA Clear Top 6 CG7 and... They were just spectacular, but that again, that's in our system. I was listening to a really, really excellent live recording uh, on RCA that um, was mastered by Bob Ludwig. And Bob Ludwig is an absolute genius as far as I'm concerned, because his work is just 
Absolutely fabulous. What's the album called, Charles? Uh, the Phil Wood 6, I think. Yeah, Phil Wood 6 live on the steamboat or something like yes, that. Yes, that sounds right. Yeah. It's got a weird album cover, too. It's <laughs> it's just, yeah, it does. It has a really weird album cover. I mean, how that got past the art director uh, at RCA, I have no idea. Um, it's a good thing it sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, the um, the album is um, is just straight ahead jazz, but it's just beautifully played. Uh, the arrangements are fabulous. The recording work was fabulous, and with these RCA tubes, well, we're talking RCA, so <laughs> it kind of fits in. Anyways, I digress. So let's put those away. Actually, to play these in the Universal, you have an adapter here. Yeah, we need these nine pin to octal adapters. Yeah. So the six GU seven and the six CG seven both will adapt over to. Uh, the six and, and seven really easily and um, they just they can work just absolutely brilliantly hmm. okay so yeah so this was a nice find and we're lucky because um, you you came across a lot of tubes yeah not a lot of new old stock but quite a few good used ones that i've been going through testing clearing matching up so they're in the store uh they're under vt22 and if you're interested in trying them out, they're they're available. We've got nice close match pairs. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for doing that, Charles. I mean, that's just something you dug into recently. So um, we do. I mean, we have thousands of tubes in the inventory um, that really they just don't. They're not in the store because we just don't have time. But every once in a while, Charles decides to dig into a bin. <laughs> I have a little bit of spare time. <laughs> a little bit of well, you you can work pretty intensely at it. Mm. So. And just get them into the store and get them organized. So, anyways, thanks for doing that. I think it's time we head over to the music room. Yeah. Well, here we are in the music room. And, wow, Charles, I mean, it it was, what, about a year ago that you started the your first um, kit design? I think actually almost two years ago now uh, was the version before this guy right here. And uh, we're coming up on probably about a year uh, old on this one, which is the first prototype, or sorry, I guess the first functioning prototype of the headphone amplifier. And this was always sort of meant as a test bed for the circuit. And, and what, it, worked, it worked brilliantly, you mm -hmm. like that, and it sounds amazing. It's just a bit bulky, a little bit awkward, especially with features like its headphone, or not headphone, its speaker jacks being on the front of it here. Because it is an integrated amplifier, so even though its primary function is as a headphone amplifier, you can actually drive um, reasonably efficient speakers with this, and we put it in our main system and it sounds amazing. Yep. Um, and this has been in an almost daily use since it was completed as well. I use this for clearing tubes constantly and it's great for noise testing. Yeah, I was showing it off actually last week when I was talking about noise testing. Mm -hmm. But this is, I mean, when you first came up with the idea of an integrated headphone amp, you said, I want the chassis to go vertical. Yep. And you had some beautiful sketches of the original concept. Yeah, originally we were hoping to have some sort of swept panel on the side that would also double as the legs. It didn't end up working out that way. It was just going to be too complicated to build. But I think we found a nice compromise here that also looks fantastic. So the only thing that's really not in place is, besides the fact that the... It's not wired up on the not, inside yet. It's not wired <laughs> up, is uh, we'll have a brushed aluminum panel on each side. Mm -hmm. um, but right now we have... Um, uh, the same plinth material we use for all of our kits. This is black cherry. It's a, a fruit hardwood that is um, just one of the, the best of the cabinet woods that you can work with. And um, it's got a hand waxed, a wax oil hand butt finish on it with a couple of different products that I've used. And it just looks absolutely fabulous. Yeah, yeah, we're very happy with that. Well, I really like how you, I mean, one of the big problems we had was trying to figure out how to, to allow good airflow and ventilation for, um, for, the, for the four tubes that 
were required. While also keeping them fairly protected. And safe uh, from I, little hands and things like that. Yeah, this is fine for us, but uh, we didn't want to set any cats on fire. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this is the better option here. <laughs> yeah, well, you might have to vacuum the cat fur out from underneath here periodically. But um, yeah, so uh, sonically though, this should be, this is the production prototype. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the next step after this is proven to function properly and, and maintain the low noise of this uh, prototype um, is we actually will start manufacturing components and it won't be that long hopefully before we'll be calling for test builders um, but yeah it's been a long road I was I was I actually started estimating what our development costs were on this amp and it's probably about 10 times what we normally put into a kit yeah and um, which means that this probably should sell for about ten thousand dollars probably finished it, finished not as a kit it's but. not going to be that expensive <laughs> we promise but it is not going to be a cheap kit or a cheap finished amplifier it yeah. just can't be yeah um, we, we actually never recover development costs in the short term so it's not actually in the costing of an amplifier uh, our hope is that over the long term because we're in this for the long term that um, uh, we'll sell enough units over the coming decades that uh, we'll recover the initial investment, mm -hmm. which was huge. Uh, it could easily be about $60,000 that we put into developing this. So, But um, you do get a lot with it. I mean, so it's running essentially a dual mono power supply with a shared transformer. It has four stages of filtering on that power supply since headphones tend to be extremely sensitive and they'll pick up any ripple. They, this is very quiet. This is going to be even quieter. And that was a big part of going vertical, right? Was to keep the noisy part yep. down low and have um, have stages of shielding that would um, that would get the noise floor as low as possible. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons why it took so long to develop it was yeah it was working on not only getting the circuit up to. Um, the circuit sounded fabulous from the very first one you came up with. But I spent many, many hours tweaking it uh, to get it perfect. Yeah, and both to get power yep. and to, to maintain low noise, mm -hmm. as well as stability in the power tubes. The power tubes are absolutely fabulous. Oh, they, they've been great, yeah. We're running... Um, the uh, 6P, 1P, EV Svetlana's. Yeah, this is the real Svetlana. So SCD is the proper company, Svetlana Electronic Devices. And um, the the, uh, the sonics of this tube are just out of this world. And we're driving it with the... With the 6N6P, probably my favorite dual triode ever. Uh, yep. They're just fantastic, rock solid tubes. They just do everything. Um, I, there's almost no production apps using them. Yeah, very few, uh, I, which is just amazing to me. They just do so many things so well. Yeah. And because of the time that we spent tweaking this and working on the circuit, this is a true two watt headphone amplifier. And uh, hang on, oh. because I actually saw somebody advertising. Um, a wattage and not specifying yeah. whether it was max power <laughs> or whether it was watts rms max power is twice as much power as watts rms yeah and it is a meaningless specification so whenever you see a piece of gear saying a thousand watts max power you know that they're f they're <laughs> <laughs> i almost said something yeah. really bad um that they're full of it yeah but, yeah so um so this is two watts rms per channel, because sometimes you'll see on, you know, Chinese amplifier spec sheets, they'll say two watts, but they mean one watt per channel. And uh, that's continuous duty. That's continuous. That's across the entire range of selectable impedances for whatever headphones you have, including the eight ohm output for speakers. But nobody, and I don't think there's ever been a pair of in, even in, inefficient headphones. There's nobody out there that is going to ever want to be running this anywhere near max. In fact, with headphones, even less efficient headphones, you're down around, what, one quarter volume? And you, that's yeah, it. You're about a quarter. Maybe uh, the least efficient ones we have, I'll, I'll go up to a third at the absolute most, but that's really loud. <laughs> and when we're driving the main speakers, um, not the headphones, but when we're driving our main speakers, which are about 93 dB efficient, 
Uh, we're running it at about half volume. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, well done, Charles. There, we'll actually be putting up um, a detailed video uh, in our other channel under Kid Amps as soon as the prototype is up and running and it's got a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and as soon as that's done, the full circuit will get published. We essentially give away the circuit design um, and uh, and put it in the the public commons. Yeah. So if you wanted to, you could buy all the components yourself and build one on your own. Yeah. 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 And maybe you have all the components under your bench. And <laughs> not likely, but yeah. yeah it's possible. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, congratulations, Charles. I'm, I'm just thrilled. I can't wait to, to listen to the final production version. Well, with any luck, uh, maybe we'll have it back on screen next week. Let's see. But for now, let's head back and see what came in. Well, let's just take a quick look and see what came in recently. Uh, I think I talked about these a couple of weeks ago. We got in a new um, revised type of octal socket saber lifter. These are made by, we buy directly from the manufacturer Amtata, and he's come up with a new manufacturing technique that is, in my opinion, far superior to the old type, which were really nice socket savers. We sold thousands of the old type. But the new type have been, <laughs> we sold so many in the first uh, week, I think, after I showed them off, um, that I had to reorder. And we order a lot at a time. So anyways, uh, the reorder came in. So we've got good inventory in stock. Yeah. And aren't they just beautiful looking? I mean, they're they're shiny. They are, um, they are very consistent in their fit and finish. They just look absolutely beautiful. The old ones, like Dad was saying, are great, but these are just take it to a whole other level. Yeah, and he, the manufacturer, we chat a little bit. His English isn't that good, and of course, um, my Chinese is, is non-existent. Um, but we chat a little bit uh, as time goes on, and he really wanted to improve. This part's identical. This is ceramic with brass receivers. It's just perfect. And, yeah, they've always been great. Um, but he d he never liked the fact that the brass would tarnish and you'd have to polish it up if you wanted it shiny and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and actually, here's one of the old ones to compare it to here. Well, this is a used one that's been around for years. And this is what they look like. Now, you could take a little buffing cloth, um, a polish cloth, and in, I bet you three minutes this thing would be bright and shiny again. Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't mind patina, but you can see you can see why he was fussing. <laughs> and from his point of view, the problem is um, unless the brass sheet stock that they manufactured from is perfect, he's stuck because he can't use imperfect uh, parts. And brass sheet stock, if you work with metal, you'll know that trying to get good surfaces is really tough. Um, so. I think he was suffering a lot of losses and, and pain in the ass <laughs> manufacturing problems, basically working around, you know, basically cosmetic imperfections. So anyways, so anyways, these are back in stock. Um, and we've been selling a lot of my absolute favorite um, EL34. These are the, the true vintage Mullard XF2s. They're rebranded for Westinghouse. And Westinghouse thought so much of them, they called them their premium line. And, and if you look here, it even says made in West Germany on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of shenanigans going on. So, um, yeah, I mean, these just do everything well. The only problem, here's your manufacturing codes. You're going to see, now they often, they get a little faded over time. And sometimes people clean the tubes. And they forget to skip over this, and this will come right off if you clean the tube. But you'll see an XF2, and then a what looks like an 8, but in fact, it's a capital B. So that stands for Blackburn, England, and now UK, of course. And then you get a digit, and there's a 9. So that's going to either, that can only be 69, because the tubes were made from about 1960, I think the last production year is 1973. I think I've seen a 73. It probably ended in early 73. Anyways, um, we got a couple more of them in uh, and we're probably gonna be testing them right after we're done shooting this video. We still have good inventory, but mm -hmm. it's going down fairly quickly. Some, I shouldn't say some, a lot of the premium vintage inventory 
is being bought down. People are trying to secure um, their personal stash. Yep. Of, I think we had one customer buy a quad and then immediately a couple weeks later buy a second one. Yeah, and then uh, and it's quite often the one of the most common things that happens these days is people will send us a note and they'll say, "Have you got? Uh, I've lost the power tube." Uh, from the set I bought from you last year or two years ago, sometimes even three or four years ago, and um, have you got a match spare? And we keep records for every single tube that we sell, um, so we can go back, um, look up uh, what this, what the test results were for your original order, and that's the same for preamp tubes. And with any luck, we'll be able to match up your quad again and keep it going for you. Yep. And that's becoming more and more common. And as tubes get scarce and eventually become extinct, um, we'll always have singles lying around um, and pairs, uh, but not necessarily quads. And with any luck, we'll be able to keep um, your sets going for years and years. Mm -hmm. And these are really exciting. Charles found a lot of these. And, f and these are the Millsback version of the famous Sylvania bad boys. So they've got the elevated black T plates. Well, maybe not mill spec. They're labeled for the military, yes. but they're almost certainly the same build. I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> I was going to get to it in a second. I'm not as young as you are, so I'm not as quick. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're right. Most likely they're basically identical to the non Jan labeled mm -hmm. tubes. We see them uh, labeled both ways and there's no difference between the tubes. No, no. They all have the same problems in the same wonderful Sonics. Mm -hmm. And one of the big problems, these and many early tubes, these date back um, to the uh, late 1930s, but most of the production that you see were made in the 1940s into the early 1950s. I think the last year of production was 1952. Um, so most of the tubes that survived that we see were made in the early 1950s. And... Um, the glue that bonds the glass to the plastic inside underneath here, the bedding compound, it dries out over time. Yep. And the, and the glass in the base basically get, first they get slightly loose and then they get looser and looser. When there's a small amount of movement, it's just not a big deal. Just as you long as you're not grasping the tube by the glass, which you should never be doing anyway while you're installing it. It doesn't matter if the tube was made last month or 50 years ago. You should never, ever handle it like this. Now, you can hold it like this if you want to clean it or something. But if you're installing it into a socket like it's this, yeah. you're, you line it up like this. In fact, if you're installing a socket saver lifter, um, you install the tube into the socket saver lifter first, like this. I'm not going to push it all the way in. And so you see how my fingers are working on the base only. I'm not touching the glass. And then the whole assembly goes into the amp like that. And then the whole thing, with any luck, will just pull out. That's the proper way of doing it. Um, anyways, these are amazing tubes. Now these are, let me see if I can get the... I've got a, a little 12 volt note on here. These are the 12 volt version, of course, of the 6SN7 bad boys. The tubes themselves electrically are identical, but what is different is the filament. Yeah. So instead of a 6 volt filament, there's a 12 volt filament. Now, thankfully, in the last maybe two years, we've been seeing other manufacturers doing what we do with our kits and include options for changing the filament voltage on some of them. Yeah. When we first started building uh, what became our universal line of preamps, um, uh, there was only uh, one or two small boutique manufacturers um, doing changeable voltages on the filaments. Mm -hmm. And now, um, you know, to their credit, I think a lot of people have seen that we were selling units. <laughs> well, and also that's just a very easy thing to add on to something to make it much more flexible to allow tubes like these great vintage bad boys to be played played again. Yeah, and I mean the the, the basic. Uh, the basic reason, of course, is that the six volt tubes have all been used up and what's left in the marketplace are mostly um, the bottom of the barrel, basically. Or if they're good, they're extremely expensive. Yeah. So whereas for the 12 volt versions like the 12SN7, there's the 12SL7 as well as a similar tube. 
Um, there's still reasonably good selection available and um, Charles is the rebase glue master. You, when he's done, you can't tell that it's been rebased and he's using basically the same materials that the original gluing was. Yep. Uh, sometimes was done. Uh, even just uh, plain alcohol will help dissolve the original glue and get it reseated again, but not always. Yeah, yeah. So these are just absolutely gorgeous, and we've got a lot of these in. And um, how are they testing so far? Uh, actually, surprisingly good. This is pretty representative here of what we've been getting, testing right around new old stock, right where they should be, and uh, pretty happy with them. Yeah, and of course, the sound of the, of the bad boy is just... <laughs> it's it's unbelievable caution you cannot play the earlier lower spec 6sn7 gt in every amp in every amp most modern amps um i would not recommend it because they will get noisy and permanently damaged that's one of the reasons why when we designed the universal 6 or 12 sn7 kit preamp that I actually used the data sheet for the original Sylvania GT mm -hmm. when I set it. And this, the reason why you can't do that is because the specs are a full third, the key specifications or electrical properties are a full third lower than the more modern GTA, GTB. Well, that's the plate voltage, but the, um, the maximum dissipation is actually half of the modern version. It's amazing. It's almost half the power of the tube. Yeah. Yeah. And that's probably where you're getting caught. It, it's possible that manufacturers um, think that they're okay because they're, they're right on the edge of the spec. Mm -hmm. But you, no, no designer worth their salt ever designs anything near the edge of the specification. Yeah. Yeah. So that's probably where they're getting caught. And, and of course, some GT tubes are going to be better than others. Some of them were better built. We have some mil spec uh, rebase Loctals that are technically GTs that perform quite well. And are probably really GTAs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And but then we also have some other GT. What was the other version that we got in with these bad boys? Were they Raytheons or? Um, what? Well, yeah, I forget now. Well, uh, anyway, we got in a, a smaller batch of GTs along with these, and they are just they're not performing well at all. <laughs> <laughs> and it happens like that. So sometimes we we take a chance and we basically take a loss. So. Yeah. But anyway, such is life. For the moment, though, we've got lots of 12-volt bad boys. So that's, that's good news. And we'll have them for a while. Um, and if you stayed till the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. And we can reach almost everybody with flat rate $20 shipping. But if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim and Charles signing off. Cheers, everyone.